Hello everyone, welcome to this presentation. This time we are going to talk about grid tight inverters. We will see an introduction where we talk about voltage source and current source grid tight inverters. Then we will focus on the sinusoidal PWM voltage source grid tight inverter. We will talk about closed loop operation and finally we will see some simulation examples to illustrate this topic. So a grid tight inverter is a power converter in which we have a DC input power source like this one here, a solar, a solar panel here, that is generating a DC voltage at the output then usually we use first a DC-DC converter in order to generate an appropriate level of voltage here at this point at the input of the uh, grid tight inverter. Usually this type of DC-DC converters incorporates a maximum power point tracking methodology in order to optimize the extraction of the energy from the solar panel or other elements from which we want to obtain the energy. So the grid tight inverter, properly speaking, corresponds to this stage here in which we are connecting the DC level at this point with the AC network. And we want to inject into the network a current waveform like this one which is going to be in phase with the grid voltage. So as we can see the power follows this way that we are showing here and the power goes from the solar panel into the grid in such a way that we are going to have this power factor almost equal to 1. And therefore, the power that we are going to inject into the grid is going to follow this expression here, which is 1 over 2 times the peak voltage of our grid times the peak current that we are injecting. So the main objective of our grid tight inverter is to generate this current in phase with the voltage. There are two main types of grid tight inverters. One is the voltage source grid tight inverter in which the output of the inverter behaves as a voltage source and because the grid behaves also as another voltage source we need some kind of element in order to limit the current between them. Usually an inductor is employed for this purpose. The other type is the current source grid tight inverter. In this case the inverter is behaving like a current source at the output so we can modulate the current in order to have a sinusoidal current and inject this current into the grid but in this case the inverter in reality is a DC-DC converter in which we are modulating some control parameter to obtain the correct waveform sinusoidal waveform of the current so we need an unfolder circuit usually a full bridge uh, made with four transistors so at the end we are going to inject a sinusoidal current into the grid. So in this case we don't need any current limit, uh, limiting element but we need the unfolding circuit. In this video we are going to focus on the voltage source grid tight inverter and we will probably talk about the current source grid tight inverter in a future video. Now let's see how to inject current into the grid by using a voltage source like this one here the, the inverter is going to behave like a voltage source at the output and then the grid voltage is another voltage source so we cannot connect them together in parallel because the current is, going, is not going to be limited so we need some kind of element in order to limit the current between these two voltage sources in principle we could use an any element to limit this current. We could use a resistor, we could use a capacitor, we could use an inductor. Obviously if we use a resistance it's not a good solution because we are going to have a lot of losses. We could use a capacitor but the best possibility is to use an inductor because in this way the inductor is going to be 
employed also in the filtering of the high frequency harmonics. So this is the best possibility in this case and is the possibility that it is normally used. So then we have this equivalent circuit here. We can study this circuit with it's uh, really easy to do using the knowledge of the circuit theory and then we can obtain this expression for the current that is going to circulate between the two voltage sources. We can express also this relationship between the two voltage sources and the current and then we can draw this phasor diagram in which we also can see graphically the relationship between the different elements. We have the, the grid voltage VG phasor which is this one. We have the phasor corresponding to the current which we want to be in phase with the voltage. So because we have an inductance, the voltage across in the inductance is going to be like this one. Okay, JXL times the phasor of the current. So finally, we obtain here the um, voltage that we need. So we need this amplitude of the voltage and also with this phase. If we generate this voltage, then this is the current that is going to circulate into the grid. So then we can obtain these two values, the amplitude of the voltage that we need to inject and then the phase that is required between the grid voltage and the output voltage of our inverter. Here we can see that we have two known values which are the uh, voltage of the grid and also the current that we want to inject into the grid. And we don't know VO, which is the amplitude of, of the voltage that we need to generate the inductance and also the angle of the, in the phase between the two voltages. But we can see also that we have a condition. The output voltage that we are going to generate needs to be higher than the grid voltage because in this triangle always VO has to have an amplitude greater than VG. So coming again here to this we can see that we have only two equations and we have three unknown parameters here so we have the possibility of fixing one of them and then calculate the other two. For example we can fix the value of the inductance and then we can calculate calculate the required value of BO and phi. To make this clear, we are going to see a particular example here in which we want to inject a 1 ampere RMS into the grid and the grid has a 230 volts and 50 hertz. So in this case, the power that we are going to inject is equal to 230 watts. Let's set L equal to 10 millihenries because this is a typical value that could be used as a filter when we operate at a high frequency like 100 kilohertz for example. So we are going to fix this value of the inductance and then this is the impedance that we are going to have for our inductance. Then as we have seen before using these two equations we can calculate the value corresponding to VO which is equal to this one 230.02 volts RMS uh, which is equivalent to 325.3 peak voltage and the phase phi is 0.782 degrees, which is equivalent to 0.0435 milliseconds or 43.5 microseconds. So we can see that this is very small and also we can see that the difference between the difference in amplitude between VO and VG it is also very small 325.3 and 325.27 so this is really shocking so we are going to test this um, with a couple of LTS spice simulations this is the equivalent circuit of our grid tight inverter implemented in LTS pipes. We can see the voltage VO, the voltage VG, and the inductance in between. 
So we can run the simulation and see the results. We can see in the current through the grid. We can see that is sinusoidal, and we can also show the grid voltage. And we can see that both of them are in phase. If we measure the RMS current injected into the grid, we can see that the value is the correct one, equivalent to one ampere, as we have just calculated. Also, we can Check here and that if we make a little change in the sinusoidal voltage, for example, in the grid, let's say that we change this to 330.27 volts, which is only an increase of 5 volts uh, in the grid voltage amplitude, then let's see what happens when we run the simulation again. So we can see now that in grid we have, in green, sorry, we have the uh, grid current and it is no longer in phase with the grid voltage. So a small change here can make our system operate wrongly. So the question here is how to implement physically our grid type inverter so it is going to assure that the current is going to be always in phase with the grid voltage. This slide shows the common implementation of a PWM inverter using sinusoidal PWM modulation. We employ here a full bridge inverter in order to generate um, two level waveform here in this case with a maximum value equal to VDC to the input this input voltage and a minimum value equal to minus VDC and we generate the switching pattern for these transistors here by comparing a sinusoidal waveform of reference with a triangular high frequency waveform. This is very well known. I am not going to enter into detail because this is something that we can find in any book of power electronics. So at the end we are going to generate this square waveform with a, a modulation, PWM modulation, in which the first harmonic of this waveform follows a sinusoidal waveform, which is the one that we want to inject into the grid. So if we analyze the harmonic content of this um, uh, PWM waveform generated here at the output, we will see something like this. We have a first harmonic at the line frequency and then we have other harmonics at high frequency corresponding to the switching frequency and multiples of the switching frequency. So what we want to do is to get rid of this high frequency harmonics and also generate here through the grid a sinusoidal waveform of the current. So we need this element, the inductance, to perform also a role of filter in order to limit the harmonic content through the uh, grid. So this is quite easy to study. We can consider that and we have here a voltage source and using the superposition law we can study the circuit at line frequency like here in which we have both the first harmonic generated but by our inverter and then we have the voltage source corresponding to the grid and then we can limit as we have seen in previous slide the current through the grid. And if we consider the high frequency operation for each harmonic we can draw this equivalent circuit in which we have the inductor in series and then now we have a short circuit here corresponding to the grid because we don't have high frequency voltage in the grid. So we can calculate the amplitude of each harmonic by this simple expression here. So the current is going to be limited at high frequency because of the impedance of the inductor. So coming back again to our example, with this structure we can implement this equivalent circuit generating VO and injecting the current into the grid and we have the inductor limiting the, the current.
but still we have the problem of the small difference in amplitude between VO and VG and also the small difference in the phase between both of them. We have seen that any small change in the amplitude of VG or in the phase is going to make that the current is not going to be in phase with the grid voltage and also the amplitude is going to change. So the question here is how can we achieve this level of accuracy in the difference between the, the output voltage VO and the grid voltage and also in the phase between them. And the answer to this question is by making our system to operate in closed loop. By operating in closed loop, we can achieve this level of accuracy. Here we can see the schematic of our grid tight inverter operating in closed loop. What we do is to measure the current that is circulating through the grid with this sensor here. And by using a compensator, we are going to make this current follow a reference current which is this one here with a given amplitude and in phase with the voltage of the grid. This sinusoidal reference is generated by measuring the voltage in the grid and using a PLL we generate a perfect sinusoidal waveform which is going to be in phase with the voltage grid. And finally, using a multiplier, we can adjust the amplitude of our current reference to the required value by multiplying the output of the PLL by a reference level. So by changing this reference level, we can change the amplitude of the current that we are injecting into the grid and therefore the power that we are sending into the grid. One question here is why to use a PLL instead of directly measuring the voltage in the grid and generating a sinusoidal waveform that is going to be proportional to the voltage in the grid. And the answer to this question is because the grid is not a perfect sinusoidal waveform. Usually it can have distortion, disturbances and so on. So we don't want that these disturbances, this distortion and the noise to be reproduced in our reference signal and then injected again into the grid. Let us continue with our example. We are going to select a 400 volt input voltage here at the input of our inverter in order to generate the sinusoidal voltage, the first harmonic here, that, is, that we want to be equal to 325.3 peak in order to inject 1 ampere RMS into the grid. So, from the study of this type of inverters with a sinusoidal PWM modulation and using this type of modulation, which in this case is the two-level modulation or bipolar modulation, we know that the amplitude of the first harmonic, VO1, is going to be the amplitude modulation index times the DC voltage that we have at the input. So with this we can calculate the amplitude modulation index that we need in our case, which is equal to 0.8132. Also, from the study of this type of PWM converters, we can obtain this uh, table here, which has been obtained from this reference. And in this table, we can see the harmonic content that we are going to have uh, in the PWM waveform that our inverter is generating. So in this case, we are very close to this column here. Our modulation index is 0.8, so the amplitude of the first harmonic is also 0.8, and these are the amplitudes corresponding to the other harmonics. Let's now do a simulation of our inverter in LTSPICE. 
Here we can see a simplified model of our inverter in which we are using a comparator in order to compare the triangular waveform with our sinusoidal waveform of reference. The sinusoidal waveform has an amplitude which is proportional to the triangular waveform with the modulation index and also a um, given phase as we have seen before and we can adjust this here, these parameters here. The triangular waveform is 5 volt of amplitude, the, this is the modulation index and this is the phase of our sinusoidal reference. The switching frequency is going to be 100 kHz. So with this comparator we are going to generate at the output of the comparator the PWM waveform with a level which is going to be between plus 1 and minus 1 and then using this uh, voltage source we are going to multiply this waveform by 400 so at the end at the output of this voltage waveform we have our PWM waveform with the required amplitude of plus 400 volt and minus 400 volt. Then we have the inductor to limit the current and the uh, voltage source corresponding to the grid. So we can run our simulation and see the results. We are running the simulation up to 100 milliseconds and saving the results from 60 milliseconds on. So let's check first how our comparator is working a little bit. We have here our sinusoidal reference in green and then we have the triangular waveform here so we can see for example how the comparison is working here we have the sinusoidal waveform at a given instant the triangular waveform let me see this again and then we can add another pane and see the output of the comparator so it corresponds to the PWM waveform. We can also see the output of the voltage source and then we have the corresponding PWM waveform with a minimum value of minus 400 volt and the maximum value of 400 volt. Now we can check the current that is circulating or that we are injecting into the grid so we see how the current is sinusoidal and we can check that the amplitude is correct is approximately one ampere as we want we can delete now this pane and add the voltage in the grid so we can also see that the current and the voltage are uh, in phase we can add another pane in order to see this better so we can see that both the voltage and the current are in phase as expected we can also take a look at the harmonic content of the different waveforms. For example, if we want to check the harmonic content of the PWM waveform generated by our inverter, we can go here and select view and FFT. And now selecting the waveform corresponding to the PWM modulation, we say OK here. And then we can see the amplitude of the different harmonics. For example, we get here the amplitude of the fundamental harmonic at 50 Hz, which is 47.18 dB. We have to take into account that here the measurement is in dB. So we need to calculate the amplitude using this expression here. So we have the um, amplitude in dB obtained with this expression so in order to obtain the amplitude of each harmonic we have to do this operation shown here 
We can also see the other harmonics that we have in our PWM waveform at high frequency. For example, if we take a look here, these are the different harmonics that we have at the switching frequency and close to the switching frequency as we have seen in the table before. We can also take a look at the harmonic content of the of the current through the grid. So we go mu and FFT again and select the current through the grid. And we can again see the different harmonic uh, content. So we see here the first harmonic and the harmonics corresponding to the uh, high frequency. And we see that with the inductor, these harmonics are quite attenuated. So we also see that in the waveform, in time, the ripple and the harmonic content is quite low. The other possibility to obtain from the simulation the amplitude of the different harmonics is by using the dot for statement. So here we have done the analysis of the PWM waveform around 50 Hz and calculating a total of 15 harmonics. The result of this analysis can be seen by pressing Ctrl L on the keyboard and then we can see here the different harmonics and for example the fundamental harmonic has an amplitude which is 325.3 volts as expected. We could select here other frequencies and other number of harmonics in order to obtain the amplitude of the harmonics at high frequency. So the next step is to operate our system in closed loop because we know that any small change, for example, in the grid voltage or in the phase of the voltage that we are injecting is going to affect a lot to the current amplitude and phase that we are injecting into the grid. So for this, we need to first model our system and then later design a compensator. Our system can be seen like here in this uh, schematic in which we are controlling the amplitude and the phase of the first harmonic uh, that is being generated by the PWN inverter. Then we have our inductor. Here we have included the series resistance of the inductor in order to have more accuracy and then we have the grid voltage. If we consider a small time interval within the line period then we can see our circuit also like a time varying uh, voltage source here that it is following a sinusoidal waveform. So we can introduce perturbations in this equivalent circuit in time and then we will obtain this equivalent circuit in the, the plus domain in which we can obtain very easily the relationship between the voltage and current perturbation obtaining at the end this expression for the transfer function of our system. We can think of using a compensator like this one, a PI compensator with one zero and one pole at the origin and then this would be our uh, block diagram of our our circuit with the compensator, our plant, which is our uh, inverter, and then the sensor for the current that we are going to use with a gain equal to one. So if we represent the different body diagrams, we have in red the diagram corresponding to our plant, to the inverter, with one pole at this frequency. And then here we have in blue the diagram corresponding to the compensator. So if we place the zero of the compensator at the same frequency as the pole of our plant, then the loop game is going to follow a straight line like this one in green, which follows or which has a minus 20 dB per decade of slope. So in this way and we can obtain the bandwidth of our system 
by uh, looking at the point in which uh, this uh, loop gain crosses the zero dBs. With this, we can obtain the bandwidth. And also, we can see that our system is going to be stable because the crossing, the, the slope at the crossing is at minus 20 dBs per decade. So in principle, this could be a good design for our compensator. Now we are going to see a particular example in which we have a value for the inductance that we have seen before equal to 10 millihenries. And now we are also considering the serial resistance of the inductance equal to 0.1 ohm. So we have seen before that the response of our system follows this expression here. So from this expression we can calculate the pole frequency. The, this time is equal to 1.59 Hz. And then we can obtain also the DC gain of our system, which in this case is 20 dB ampere per volt. If we consider also the gain of the sensor, which in this case is equal to 1, as we have selected, then the DC gain of the product G times H, the plant and the sensor, it will be equal to 20 dB. So now with this information we can do the design of our compensator. We are placing the zero of the compensator at the same frequency of the pole of the system. So we have this equation, first equation to design our compensator. Then we have selected the gain at high frequency of the compensator equal to 40 dB. So we have another equation here for the design. With this, the loop gain is represented here in green and it's going to be like this. And it is going to get 0 dB at a frequency of 1.59 kHz which is much greater than 50 Hz. So we are more than one decade above 50 Hz. So in principle, with this, we will have a um, good response to generate our current waveform. So with these two equations and selecting a value of the capacitance of one microfarad, then we can obtain the values of the resistances R1 and R2, like shown here. Also, we have to take into account that in this design, we are neglecting the response of the operational amplifier we know that due to the behavior of the operational amplifier, we are going to have some effects at high frequency and also at low frequency. At high frequency, the gain of the response of the compensator is going to decrease at some point and also at low frequency, the gain is going to be limited due to the effect of the operational amplifier. So in the next slide, we are going to see how to polish or to check the design of the compensator using LTSPIs. This is the schematic of the loop gain of our system in LTSPIs. Here we can see the compensator that we have implemented using this operational amplifier with a um, DC gain equal to 100 dB and a 0 dB bandwidth of 1 MHz. So then we have here our plant with the inductor and the series resistance and the sensor in order to measure the current which is circulating through the inductor. And in this case, because in our system we want to have an output which is equivalent to 1 volt per ampere, then we are multiplying here by 10 because this resistance is 0.1. And note that we are using here a negative sign in order to compensate the negative sign that we have in this implementation of the compensator. So we can run the simulations and see the result. We are injecting at the input an AC signal of 1 volt. So we can measure, for example, the output of the compensator. If we want to see the, the transfer function of CS as we have seen it in previous slides, we need to add here a minus sign. 
and then we can see that we have a zero at one at the expected frequency of 1.59 hertz and then we have the gain at high frequency which is 40 db and we have this other pole here due to the effect of the operational amplifier as we have explained before so we can now see the response the complete response of the loop gain by measuring the output here and then we see that it is as expected here the slope is equal to minus dB per decade and then we get the effect of the operational amplifier let's check and the um, bandwidth at zero dBs so we can see that we have um, zero crossing at 1.56 kilohertz as we uh, expected as we have designed and the phase here is 98.9 degrees so our system is going to be stable because we have a phase margin of more than 80 degrees so with this we can go ahead and test our compensator with the grid tight inverter first we are going to test the compensator that we have just designed with the ideal implementation in lt spice of the grid tight inverter as we can see here so we are implement we have implemented here the compensator with this voltage source we are measuring the current through the grid so this is our current sensor with a gain of one volt per ampere and then here we have the reference that we are injecting into the compensator and this will be equivalent to the output of the PLL and the multiplier so here our um, reference is a sinusoidal waveform with an amplitude of 1 ampere RMS so the peak value is 1 times the uh, square root of 2 and then we are sending the output of the compensator into the comparator so now we are not longer preoccupied about the amplitude and the phase of the sinusoidal waveform that we are injecting here because the compensator is going to take care of that for us so now with this we can run the simulation and see if the result is correct so we are going to measure the current into the grid here so we can see how it is a sinusoidal waveform as expected we can measure the RMS value which is around 1 ampere 0.98 mil, eh, amperes so this is ok and we can check that also the current is going to be in phase with the grid voltage so we can measure the grid voltage and we can see that it is in phase with the current we can add another pane if we want to see this better so we can see that in principle everything is working pretty well so now we can try our uh, design with an actual converter including transistors and drivers and so on so this is the implementation of the actual converter we can see the full bridge a driver for the switches and then we can see the compensator here below so for the driving of the switches we have used this driver that we have developed before uh, my driver for half bridge you can get information about this driver uh, in this video LTS spice number 10 how to create a half bridge driver with programmable dead time and using this driver we are driving this transistor M1 and M2 and also transistor M4 and M3 because we know that at the end transistor M3, M3 is going to be activated simultaneously with M1 so with this voltage source we are generating the same signal as this output here and for transistor M4 
is the similar situation with respect to M2 because it is going to operate simultaneously with M2. So we are generating the driving signal with this voltage source obtained from this output here. In this driver, we can adjust the dead time of the switches by selecting this time constant here. We have selected here 100 nanoseconds, which is at the end equivalent to a dead time of around 300 nanoseconds. And here we have the implementation of the compensator, as we have seen before. And the only difference here is in that we are limiting the output using this operational amplifier with a positive power supply and a negative power supply. This is very important to obtain good results in our simulation because we have to limit the output. So we are always generating here an output that is going to be in the range of the triangular waveform. So we can run the simulation now and see the result. We can again measure the current being injected into the grid. So we see that it is a sinusoidal waveform. We can measure also the voltage of the grid, which is now between these two points. And we see that they are in phase, the current and the voltage. We are almost finishing our simulation. Now it is ready, so we can see that the voltage and the current are in phase. We can again open another pane and see the voltage in this other pane so we can see that they are in phase and then we can measure the amplitude of the current so we can see again that it is more or less equal to 1 ampere here is 0.96 amperes so with this we finish today this presentation i hope that this lesson today is useful for your future activities please let me know below if you have any comment or question and i hope to see you in the next video goodbye now